Well, uh, Sia, uh, my name is uh, John Keane. I am professor of politics at the University of Sydney and at the uh, Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, the WZB. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to uh, be with you uh, at the Institute uh, of Advanced uh, Studies in Kaseg. And I am very um, honored and thrilled to uh, present some thoughts about the subject of citizenship and the new despotism. I think we are all aware that we are living through a period where the field of citizenship is heavily contested, in which there are, in fact, uh, multiple contradictory uh, dynamics uh, in our current day. Uh, physicists would speak uh, in the quantum language of um, citizenship being flung into a position of what they call superposition. Um, parallel but braided rhythms, uh, multiple dynamics that are not entirely uh, self-consistent. For example, there are clear trends in most actually existing democracies uh, towards the feminization and the addition of queer perspectives in the definition of citizenship. Citizenship historically was uh, strongly communitarian. The right to be different uh, is part of uh, the trends of our times. Or another example, we are in media saturated societies witnessing uh, what I call in my writings digital mutinies, Black Lives Matter, for example. That is, uh, digital platformed resistances to uh, arbitrary power. And yet, there is growing concern. Shushana Zuboff has put it well about the dangers of surveillance capitalism and the destruction of citizenship. Or, one other example, there is uh, a uh, heightened awareness of the importance of cities as laboratory, laboratories of, of citizenship. And yet there is also uh, a discussion, a very interesting uh, discussion globally about the emergence of the global uh, citizen, perhaps for the first time in its history. Uh, and then one final, final example has to do with the impact of neoliberalism and compulsory austerity, the development of a precariat widening gap between rich and poor on the one hand, and signs of um, attempts to renew what Tom Marshall called social citizenship rights. These contradictory trends, uh, this, um, uh, this location of citizenship in a situation of superposition is part of the reality of our times, or so I believe. The second thing, um, therefore, that um, I would like to do is to say something about the meaning of the category of citizenship. It is indeed uh, contested, but in the European tradition, we know certain things, um, thanks to historians of uh, political thought, uh, that, for example, the etymological roots of citizenship refer back to the citizen, to the kiwis, who dwells and cooperates with others within a city, a kiwitas. We also know that um, uh, reflections on citizenship tell us that citizenship is an identity, an imagined identity, which has a, a definite measure of self-reflectiveness. Uh, it is a break with the taken for granted bonds or household or tribe or local community, for example. Rephrased, we can say that from Aristotle to the Treaty of Lisbon via Roman law, via the 12th century revival of the neo-Roman uh, understanding of law, through the Italian city-states, through the self-governing towns of Zealand and Holland, through the Polish uh, Siem, to the slogans of the French and the English revolutionaries. In all of these contexts, to be a citizen meant being an individual 
who belongs to a political community. The category is political. A, a political community of common laws and therefore the citizen, an individual embedded in a political community is understood to share certain duties uh, equally with others and certain enjoys certain entitlements equal, equally with others. This is the sense in which Aristotle defined a citizen as anyone who can hold office, as he put it. He invoked a thought that still lives on. To be a citizen is to uh, enjoy uh, community with others. It is not to be a powerless uh, subject. To be a citizen uh, is uh, to have equal opportunities to denature power, to engage freely and equally with others by exercising the, the power to define how to live together peacefully, to decide who should get how much, when, and how. So citizenship in this sense is not just about passports, for instance, or legal decisions or governmental policy making. According to this old and venerable uh, tradition of European thinking, citizenship is the condition of their possibility. It is the vision of a group of people living together as equals in a political community, enjoying uh, the entitlements uh, granted by that community and obeying the duties that are expected of uh, those uh, citizens. The third thing I want to say is uh, that of course, uh, the understanding of citizenship in the European region had multiple forms. There were variations on that ideal type uh, definition that I've just um, uh, presented to you. I, um, in preparing a, 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 a report to the European Commission some years ago, spotted at least five understandings of, of citizenship. One, most obviously is the understanding of Thomas Hobbes. To be a citizen is to be living in a political community uh, where obedience to state structures is expected. A second understanding of citizenship, Montesquieu uh, would be an example, his L'Esprit des Lois, Spirit of the Laws. To be a citizen is to be a member of a political community, a well-governed uh, political community that avoids the Hobbesian um, problem of uh, top-down rule by enabling citizens to enjoy certain freedoms and virtues, above all of its leading social groups. A third understanding of citizenship is um, the Republican understanding of citizenship. It's the kind of understanding of citizenship that you will find in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, Contrat Social, or Alexander uh, Radyshev's A Voyage from St. Petersburg to Moscow, a famous text around 1790. This third approach uh, understands citizenship as full and equal membership of a free and indivisible republic. A fourth understanding uh, historically of citizenship in Europe is the understanding of citizenship as bound up with the nation state. So uh, one becomes a citizen of a political community insofar as uh, one enjoys, shares in a common sense of national identity um, that is, uh, that is uh, held together and sanctioned through national symbols and state power. And then fifth is mentioned already the Tom Marshall view of citizenship. Um, a representative democracy, a polity in which there are periodic elections, in which there are civil rights, uh, political rights to vote, for instance, but also social rights, the entitlement to decent education, to, um, to uh, public transportation, uh, to health care. Um, this uh, understanding of social citizenship um, uh, was, of course, influential after 1945. In this lecture, I want to complicate 
this typology, this taxonomy. And I want to reflect upon a new development that seems to me to be taking place globally that represents on balance a threat to citizenship in each of these senses that forces a redefinition uh, of a political uh, form of citizenship that seems to me to be gaining ground. I'm referring to the new despotisms of the 21st century. These new despotisms are born of the Shakespearean times through which we're living, times of disorder, of disruption, times in which um, things are out of sync, in which there are many uh, developments happening that simply don't make sense. I'm referring, of course, uh, to um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. These are the grand uh, events of the last uh, half generation. Stagnation in Europe, disorder in the Arab world, a belligerent Russia, a self-confident China that is on the rise and probably becoming a global empire, and disorders within the United States. All of these trends are part of uh, our world shaping uh, times, but central, it seems to me, uh, is the birth of a new kind of political form, a new kind of um, order, which is has all the roots, but which is peculiar to the 21st century. I call these um, the new despotisms. I don't want to claim that political orders such as Putin's Russia or Erdogan's Turkey or Xi Jinping's China or Vietnam or Singapore or Orban's Hungary or Lukashenko's Belarus, I don't want to say that they are all identical polities, not all dogs are Dalmatians. But what I want to concentrate on in the remainder of this lecture, describing to you these new despotisms, what I want to say is that um, it's important to focus on the genus, uh, not the species, to look at the qualities that these political orders have in common. They have the following um, qualities. And what I want to suggest to you is that um, uh, when you reflect on their anatomy, when you look at the substantive dynamics uh, within these polities, the way they operate, the sources of their resilience, we see actually a new threat to citizenship in the sense that I described it at the very outset of this lecture. So what are these new despotisms? Why use this category? What does this category help us understand uh, about these uh, otherwise different political orders? It's tempting when thinking about these new despotisms to do what journalists often do, which is to imagine that they are rather crazy polities. You know, Alice in Wonderland um, uh, polities in which there are shouting sheep and, and talking flowers. For example, um, journalists like to quote Edoyan, Turkey's rise will not be obstructed by anyone but God. There seems to be um, a, kind of, um, a kind of recklessness about uh, these despotisms. Or Kim Jong-un from North Korea, you may know Journalists like to tell us that when he travels abroad, his feces and his urine are bagged up because he's paranoid uh, and concerned about the circulation of bogus fake news reports about the state of his health. Or think of Lukashenko uh, in uh, Belarus uh, at the beginning of this great pestilence we're living through. He, he spoke about and against the psychosis of pestilence and recommended that a good sauna and uh, a few glugs of uh, vodka would be the best remedy against COVID-19. Uh, I mean, these, these are the kinds of impressions that um, observers, outside observers have. 
reinforced by journalism, they're deeply mistaken because, as I try to show in this uh, little green book uh, published uh, quite recently, The New Despotism, these despotisms are very different than that picture uh, created, uh, that sensationalist picture. So what are their organizing principles? What characteristics do they have? They have a good handful or two of qualities and their recombinant uh, uh, character is one of their striking uh, features. They contain a mixture of organizing principles, of uh, ways of handling power that um, are the secret of their probable resilience. All of them are top-down systems of power to be sure, but all of them are what I call phantom democracies. The rulers speak often about the people. They encourage people to think that they live in a democracy. Uh, there is much talk of the people. There is also the practicing of elections in China at the local level. Uh, there is um, an appeal to the population to uh, accept uh, that actually they are the sovereign uh, people, that they authorize the existing system, that this existing system is based upon their consent. These are systems of voluntary servitude. Uh, the concept of despotism was always very good at getting at that problem, getting at the problem of top-down forms of power that perfect the arts or experiment with the arts uh, of winning the loyalty, of winning over the population, uh, encouraging their servitude in their name. These systems are not only phantom democracies, they are also systems in which clientelism, patron-client relations are omnipresent. Vassalage, uh, what Russians call kompromat, um, uh, um, is a feature of all of these systems. One um, illustration of this, um, top to bottom, dependency of actors and institutions on one another, this encouragement of patronage uh, systems that implicate everybody in the system of power. One very good illustration of this is a wonderful film by the Iranian filmmaker Mohammad uh, Rasulov. Um, it's called A Man of Integrity. You will see this point um, illustrated in great detail. All of them, in other words, uh, uh, practice uh, what Russians call blat, uh, what the Chinese call guangxi, um, uh, and this is the glue, a very important glue that binds together the system, the hierarchy of power. These new despotisms all contain middle classes. Middle classes who, once upon a time, sociologists and historians suppose would be carriers of citizenship, of active citizenship, for example, in the Tom Marshall sense. In fact, under the new despotic conditions, the middle classes tend to be quiet. They tend to be loyal. They bellyache. But uh, they accept the system, they go shopping. Edoyan, under Edoyan, uh, the number of shopping malls has increased eight times. Um, they are expected to busy themselves with their households, with their career. And this um, encouragement of the middle classes to, uh, to be loyal is a very basic um, uh, solidifying factor in these new despotisms. All of these new despotisms are plutocracies. The gap between rich and poor is great. This is true uh, for Russia as it is for China, as it is for Turkey in China. Uh, about every week, two new billionaires are minted. And in uh, 2020, during the great pestilence, well over 270 billionaires were uh, minted, newly minted in China. All of these new despotisms are forms of state capitalism in which polygarchy flourishes. This uh, concept of polygar polygarchy is a Hungarian 
uh, invention. It describes the way at the top of state power, um, state officials tend to be in business and business uh, people are um, entangled with governing um, officials. Polygarchy is a basic structural feature of these new despotisms. All of these new despotisms practice to a greater or lesser degree welfare schemes. They should not be described as kleptocracies or gangster states. Um, this is a tendency which I think uh, is descriptively misleading. For instance, in Russia, around 50% of the population, uh, uh, their daily lives of people, 50% of uh, people's lives are directly dependent upon state spending. In China, where there is a massive expansion of tertiary education, the beginning of uh, a universal healthcare system, the provision of uh, pensions, and so on, around two thirds of GDP is actually circulated um, through the state. In some of these despotisms, Singapore, for example, there are taxes, uh, uh, for example, taxes that um, GST taxes, um, general sales tax uh, taxes, partly um, redistributed back, dispersed back to the population themselves. These new despotisms are media saturated. They are efforts to harness uh, the unfinished digital communications revolution. Those who rule, rule in a media savvy way. Lots of talk of the people, uh, uh, lots of media manipulation, of course, lying and silence and bullshit, but also these are uh, regimes that are not totalitarian in the sense that they are not regimes uh, through which there is a generalized ideology, total terror and mass mobilization. In fact, uh, striking is the way research uh, tells us that these new despotisms are systems in which the authorities allow measures of protest and dissent. For example, uh, through online platforms. Why do they do this? Because they are early warning detectors of trouble. They are also mechanisms for allowing subjects uh, uh, among the population to vent their uh, frustra frust frustrations. These um, are systems in which um, there is no ruling ideology, in which those who rule, rule uh, wearing a coat of many colors. There is a kind of polychromatic quality to these new, new despotisms. Those who rule, for example, mix together different themes that um, are not coherent, but are very useful for the legitimation of power. Xi Jinping um, on a Monday can speak about socialism, the importance of the Communist Party as the source of order of the whole polity on Tuesday. He can speak about um, market reforms, about the importance of the private sector, the importance of growth. He can praise capitalism. On a Wednesday, he can speak about ecological civilization. On Thursday, he uh, can uh, speak about ancient Chinese civilization, 5,000 years old, and on a Friday can uh, give talks and interviews about democracy and the way that China is a higher form of democracy than that of the ailing United States. Finally, um, these are systems in which there is lots of talk of law, um, but in which there is a kind of phantom rule of law. There is rule through law. The courts are not independent. Uh, Edoyan likes to attack the juristocracy. Uh, the courts are servants of governmental power. Decisions that are taken are referred to as lawful, as legal. Everything is done through law, but there is no rule of law. 
And linked to this is the point that these are systems of calibrated coercion. The rulers of these systems try to hide away violence. Sometimes they are exposed. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, Alexei Navalny, the Uyghurs are victims of violence. But the system tries, these despotisms try to practice power um, by uh, exercising that power in, so to say, stocking mask form. They practice, or according to the Chinese proverb, um, the rule that they try, they occasionally kill chickens to scare monkeys. In short, the category of despotism in my work is designed to describe a 21st century political form, top-down power, which has the mix of qualities that I've just described. Striking is their resilience, the way that they build in learning mechanisms uh, to the structures of power. Um, these despotisms try to be whip smart. For instance, not only do they rely upon elections as early warning detectors, they have their think tanks. They use public opinion polling agencies. Uh, they have Facebook pages. Um, they use Instagram. WeChat uh, has 1.3 billion uh, users in China. In places like the United Arab Emirates, there are happiness forums institutionalized at various points in the polity, designed to find out why the subjects um, of this polity are less than happy. The point is that um, these are despotisms that are not uh, blind, uh, that are that try to learn how better to use power. Um, and in this sense, they aim to be resilient and durable and claim to have a superior durability than that of ailing, uh, conflicted, disordered uh, Western democracies. I want to end on, on a note of um, a thoughtful note about the significance of these uh, new despotisms. If I am right that they have in common these qualities, and if I am right that um, in my hunch that these despotisms have a definite learning capacity, that they have a, an inner resilience, that they are systems of voluntary servitude, that they manage to win the loyalty of important parts of the population, then it follows that they are likely to be around uh, for at least a while. So therefore, as students of citizenship, as citizens, it would be good to begin thinking about these new despotisms, how they operate, to ponder the need to rethink taxonomies of um, different political forms, the need to rethink the unique qualities of these regimes in the 21st century. They are not, for example, fascist. They are not, for example, totalitarian. They are not, for example, autocracies. I do not think that they are well described as authoritarian systems. They are not kleptocracies. They are something new. And if this is the case, then we should ponder the threats that they pose to citizenship. If by citizenship, we mean uh, a political community in which um, active beings share uh, certain entitlements in common, act as equals and uh, are duty bound to support that political community, then striking is the way that these new despotisms crush that understanding of uh, citizenship. They uh, they present themselves as bearers of citizenship. They are, in fact, um, drivers of phantom citizenship. Thank you very much.